You mean one car, just one? Why, you yellow belly, no good, dirty, damn right. How often can you say that the enthusiasm you have when you're planning a project is equally matched by the energy that you find when it comes to actually carrying that out? I have come to the stark realization that I have spread myself a little bit too thin. I have no less diminished enthusiasm, but the energy to keep going from one project to the other is starting to wane, just slightly, just a little bit. So what I'm trying to do, and I've alluded to this before, is clear the deck thin out the fleet, get a few things finished so that we can really focus. Because I've cut my teeth now on the welding and the fabrication, and I know a little bit about wiring. That's gonna you know, feature heavily in this episode. And I feel like I could really give the Esprit as a project a really good go. I mean, to the standard that I'd really like it to be. I wanna try anyway. To this end, there won't be an interview in this episode, but like I say, it's packed full of stuff. There's lots of work. So let's get straight into it, and the first thing we're going to do is tackle some work on the Vogue. This is the offside rear caliper, and the reason we're looking at this is because it has the fitting for the brake wear sensor, and this has been ripped off the car by me, but somebody has already been at it, as evidenced by these crimped connectors on the wires. But you remember, this one wire severed when I was taking this off, but it's severed right up close to the edge of the connector. So how do we get in here? Well, I realized that these are little rubber seals in the connector. So I managed to pry the one out and it left me just enough space to get in and clean up this wire and get some solder on it in preparation for letting a new wire on here. Now I was taught to solder by the technician, the repair technician in my folks power tools shop when I was about 10. I don't remember him teaching me, but I know he did. And I've been using some basic soldering methods ever since. Soldering is simple, the two main things are that whatever you're soldering is clean and that you get enough heat into it for the solder to run. But there are other little tricks that make life easier, which is getting solder onto both ends of the two pieces I want to connect. Then you only have to reanimate this solder with a little bit of heat while you have the two things touching each other. The solder melts, you take the heat away and it will solidify holding the two things together. It is as simple as that, but there are variables which we'll get into. So anyway, I let this wire onto the stub that was left in the end of the connector. But before I did, I slid on a piece of heat shrink. Now I want to show you this heat shrink. This is marine grade heat shrink. It is adhesive lined. It has a resin inside it. You'll always tell a piece that has this resin because it will be shiny down its bore. And what happens is when you heat this, the resin melts, forms a coating between the heat shrink and the workpiece, and so seals the joint. This, like I say, is marine grade. And this is the thing to use. This is why I don't like crimped connections because they leave your joint open and prone to moisture ingress. And what that will do is oxidize your copper wire. And here's the thing. The surface of any piece of wire that is to conduct electricity is very important in terms of that current flow. So any oxidation, dirt, anything like that can impede the current flow. So this is no good. The second thing is, if you ever wanted to solder a piece of wire like this that is corroded or oxidized, solder will not take to it. You have to clean it off. And I've heard people talking about using acid pickles to clean wires like this, but I don't like that idea because capillary action will draw that pickle up the wire. You're supposed to neutralize the acid with an alkaline solution afterwards. But how do you know you're gonna get your alkaline solution to neutralize all of that acid up inside the cable? Well, as far as I'm concerned, you don't. So the way to do this is physically. Splay the wire out, rub it down with wire wool or sandpaper or clean it, just physically clean it whatever way you can and then hopefully it will take solder. Another little tip is to aid that capillary action for the solder to run, twist your stranded wire and as well, it will keep everything nice and neat when you go to solder it, but it will help the solder run through. But before we go to the car, I just wanna make a point. Don't use a naked flame, a cigarette lighter or something like that to melt your heat shrink. Use the gentleman's hairdryer, the heat gun. It's the best way, it's the only way. 
Okay, over to the car. This went on really easily and we used the heat gun to shrink the heat shrink. The last thing was there was another sever here almost all the way through on the earth wire. So I replaced that because I didn't have any of these little ring ends to crimp onto a new piece of wire. So I reused the old one. Now, to start routing this back onto the car. And this is one of the under floor beams. But no sooner had I put the loom through it that I realized I'd forgotten to put it through a lower bracket, which <laughs> I had also forgotten to put back on the car. And then I remembered that I'd forgotten to revisit something that a viewer had pointed out, which is to help these gaskets, namely this big one on the differential, to make a nice seat to seal well, it's good practice to use a bit of grease or Vaseline or something like that to rub around the gasket surfaces just to aid that seating process. So I dropped the diff off the car. I rubbed some general purpose grease all the way around the mating face on the axle itself. I sat the gasket back on there and then I rubbed some more on the mating face of the gasket. And I gotta tell you, it never gets easier to get this differential on and off the car. <laughs> anyway, with this bracket back on, I could now thread the loom through and back up through that underfloor beam and we're good to connect it all up. Now, I broke the brake lines off the unions and then put them through the same bracket again. And as we moved down to this brake junction, I realized that I'd made another oversight. The loom should have gone over this brake cable rather than under it. So I released the joint on this little brake junction, rooted the brake cable underneath the loom and put it all back together. Now, do you remember all those stainless bolts that were used to put the sandwiches of metal onto the front foot wells? Well, here's where they come into play. I'm gonna replace this little bolt that holds on this brake junction onto the axle with a stainless fitting. There's no shearing forces here. This is literally just to hold this union on. And I can come back here knowing that this will never be a seized nut and bolt, which is nice. Now, all of this loom, the ABS loom and the brake lines, they need to be affixed to the axle. We'll get to that in a second. They did get slightly bent out of shape while they were hanging up in the car, but we can tease them back into a shape that suits the axle when we get to it. So the near side caliper was next, that went on. I had put a bolt into the union for the brake line just to keep dirt out of there. And with the union back on, like I say, I was able to tease the brake line back into a shape that suited the axle better. And with that diff in, and while I'm down here, these half shaft flanges can go back in with new gaskets. And we're square on both sides. So there's the offside caliper going in, the brake line goes on, and we can tease it back into a better shape too. Now these were held on with cable ties and we'll bring some of those in in a minute. I didn't have any that were quite long enough. So these are temporary and I'll have to get some more. So the brake shields came on next. And again, I'm using cut down stainless bolts that came from the foot wells of the car, which is great. Three stainless fasteners save us money. And the brake shields are back on and we'll live to fight another day. Up top on the offside, we can now mount our brake wire sensor connection. I've forgotten to put the earth on it. This earth though, is, there's no way there's continuity down through this brake shield to the axle because the paint is all too thick. So I'm gonna to have to take off one of the brake shield mounting bolts, scrape the paint away so that we get continuity down into the axle and hence to a good earth. And then hopefully paint over it and have it be sealed. It's not ideal, but that's just the way it's gonna to have to be. And that was the work I got done on the Range Rover. Doesn't seem like much, but we've got plenty of other stuff to come, so let's get to it. We're back on the trail of jammers that we're looking for for people. And I've been chatting offline to an Irishman called Dean McCarthy, and Dean has been searching for years for his grandfather's Delage. What a thing. He sent some photographs and I just, I think these are incredible photographs. The first is of who I assume is Dean's granddad with what 
is reckoned to be a Delage D6, either that or a DI or a DE, and his granddad's Riley Red Wing. What a photograph, it's just two stunning cars and a very dapper looking gent. The second photograph, look at this car, how imposing is this thing? This is probably a Delage DR70, but again, Dean isn't sure. But to that end, he sent us a link, a really cool website. It's the Surrey Vintage Vehicle Society, and it's like an index, almost like an encyclopedia of cars from this era. So a really cool place to hang out and browse through, and the link will be in the description, so do check it out. If you recognize any of these cars, do give us a shout, we'll put you in touch with Dean, who actually also said that he thinks that there was probably a Delage dealership on St. Stephen's Green. That is the very center of Dublin. That's like the hub of Dublin city. And it's really hard to imagine a dealership of any kind on the green, but imagine these things. If you knew St. Stephen's Green, it's a park in the center of Dublin, like a park in any other city, but it, the road rings around it and it would just be very cool to think of these cars going around the center of Dublin. Anyway, give us a shout if you know anything about them. The next photographs are from Tristan J. Carroll and his dad, who is an electrical whiz, and the two gents have been going around Tristan's new to him DMC-12, his DeLorean, and getting it ship shape. He's having great fun. He said they've done a new fuel sender, new integrated fog lights, and a new electric retractable aerial, which seemingly was a lot of fun to install. I had to have a look. I had to do a little bit of scratching, a little bit of homework about the DeLorean. I knew that Lotus had developed the chassis and possibly off the kind of Esprit chassis at the time, which is the Series 1, Series 2 chassis. Um, and I knew that Dujaro had done the styling for the body. So it has those two things in common with the Esprit. But what I didn't know is that the stainless steel body is cladding a fiberglass inner shell. That was a revelation, had no idea. So there you go, very, very interesting car. Guys, I hope you're having a lot of fun. Happy days working together. That is a really cool thing. I'm gonna send you the Valley Pro kit, even though you've got that stainless steel body, there are loads of cool things in there. Wheel treatments and waxes and cleaners and all sorts of stuff. So I'm sure you can prolong the, um, <laughs> the work. Anyway, there you are. Keep it up. Thanks a million for the photos. It is very apt that the gents are working on electrics because we are about to get into some electrics on some of the cars. So have a look at this. I hope I don't make a fool of myself. Well, the CLK is gonna make a brief appearance in soup. So these are the power seats and you adjust it forward and it goes forward and you adjust it back and it goes forward. Now the switch is at the nub of this problem. And here's something that Mercedes do particularly well. All car manufacturers do it, but Mercedes are really good at using just friction fit stuff, but having it not start to rattle or creak as the car gets older. All you have to do with a switch like this is slide something broad and flat underneath it and pry it out carefully. So on the bench, you can take the switch out of the little piece of trim and you'll need a TX drive on this particular switch to take the screws out. I think this is a TX7, but these come in sets anyway. So if you get the small ones, you're gonna have the right one. You probably noticed there was kind of watermarks on that and you see these black blotches are actually water damaged. I know the left side of this car was exposed on a hill for a couple of years while it was unused. And this is the result. What happens with PCBs, printed circuit boards like this one, is that over time, if they're subjected to physical fatigue and heat cycles, which is something that you get on the interior of a car in spades, you know, massive heat fluctuations and people wailing on switches and generally being rough handed, what will happen is eventually solder joints like this will fatigue and crack. Now sometimes the cracks are so small, they're invisible to the naked eye, but on this one you can clearly see the cracks around these joints. And all you need to do is to rerun the solder on these. Some guys add a lot more solder, I do add a little bit more when I'm doing this. As far as I'm concerned you can put too much on because the physical weight of the solder isn't going to help. But it's just a case of getting a little bit of solder on the tip of your soldering iron and this tip by the way is a little bit big for what I'm doing here and like I say reflowing each joint. Now this one in the bottom corner 
it's giving me trouble because of that water damage it's got some corrosion on it it's not quite clean and it's very difficult to clean one of these things somebody suggested acetone um, like I say physical cleaning would be my preference but again you know you've got to be careful with something like this but I managed to give it a little rub and get some solder to flow onto it this is something by the way that I have found is a recurring theme on Mercedes right back from the 70s I've had the same problem in Mercedes on fuel pump relays and on cruise control units but this is something that can affect anything with a PCB so if you've got something that just inexplicably stops working or more usually starts behaving erratically before you pitch it into the hopper in the recycle center open it up there's no harm have a look check out the PCB see if you can see anything get a magnifying glass and if you're really determined to see if it's going to work ever again just flow the joints anyway some guys will just do every joint on a PCB without even looking at them and that's fair enough but it's very satisfying to fix something like this and have it cost you nothing but a few minutes and a little bit of solder. Now we're moving on to Tina, the Cortina. When Rob and I made our little trade, really the main thing for both of us was to get this rust underneath the windscreen sorted. Now I've pulled windscreens out of cars before, but they never had to go back in. <laughs> and I gotta tell you, I broke a few. So this wasn't something I was gonna do quickly or with any kind of a cavalier attitude. The first thing I did was to order a brand new windscreen rubber and make sure I had that a new windscreen chrome strip so that there was going to be no messing when we went to tackle this job because obviously the less time this car sits without a windscreen the better. So I followed accepted best practice and I cut with a blade the part of the rubber that sits in front of the glass to make the glass come out easier. So there's no going back now. And with that done, it was only a case of gently trying to tease the glass out. So with the seal out of the window aperture, I could take stock of how we were doing. And we were not doing badly at all. What I was really worried for was whether the lip that holds that rubber was going to be in good nick or not. And it is, it's in great nick. The rust that you could see outside the car was really quite localized to those areas. There is surface rust, obviously, as you can see on the lip, inside underneath where the seal would be. But like I say, it's surface rust. This will clean up just nicely. So I started by cleaning everything up a little bit just to get the, the loose crud off it. And then I made kind of a false windscreen out of some thick hard plastic. This was just to physically keep swarf and hopefully welding spatter out of the car. Take note, I just said hopefully. Oh dear. On with the work, I cut out as carefully as possible. All of the offending sections were rust in them. And again, underneath, we're doing really well. A small amount of surface rust in one or two places, but nothing that a quick blast of a wire brush didn't sort out. Now what we've got here on both ends of the A-pillar is the A-pillar runs down as the structure of the car. It runs underneath the scuttle panel and the scuttle panel is brazed onto it to make a nice smooth single panel look. And the same thing happens at the top of the windscreen where it meets the roof. The roof is brazed onto the top of the A-pillar. So the main thing to do here is get the A-pillar solid first. Quick point of note, I cut out nice big wide areas. There's no point in trying to be saving here in terms of rust. Trying to weld onto any kind of thinned out metal is just really difficult. So I also kept the pieces I cut out. The upshot is you've got these pieces that can be used as templates if they're good enough. Now it turns out these ones weren't, so I just templated off the car. Priority here is getting the A-pillar solid, and in a sense, the scuttle panel and where the roof meets it is just cosmetic. So we tackle the A-pillar repair first. And this isn't bad. Just here, you can see the braze, just a little trace of the brazing that was used to make a nice smooth finish between the scuttle and the A-pillar. 
So up top, same thing. Get the A pillar nice and solid, and then we can manage the last of the repair to make the roof meet it. You can see I'm using a piece of steel just local to where I'm welding, and I've got some cardboard on the door as well to keep the spatter off the windows, because these gasless MIG welders, they're very spattery. And my heart sank at this point, because I got inside the car to check that everything was fine, and everything was not fine. Somehow, some spatter had made its way in, and it has found its way in through the roof, behind the headlining, and it has pockmarked our once perfect driver's seat. This stopped me right in my tracks, and I rang Rob, who was being very zen as Rob is about it. I think probably more zen as he said than I am, because Rob's a very practical guy. But if you know where I can get some material for this seat or a replacement driver's seat, please let me know, because I don't like to give this car back to Rob any worse than it was when I took it. Anyway, the repair to the roof, thankfully, isn't too bad and I moved on to the near side bottom of the windscreen. This was almost a mirror repair to the offside and before I went to make templates for the finishing panel for the scuttle, I just hit inside the scuttle with some nice thick grey primer. The spatter incident happened on the third day of work on Tina and like I said, it stopped me in my tracks. So I forced myself to make up the templates for this scuttle panel and the three towards the center of the windscreen, but I was done with welding. I always find that if your mood isn't great, there's no point in forcing an issue. You're only gonna make more mistakes. So we'll get back to this the next time and Tina will be ship shape once more. Before you touch that dial, there is social media. There will be links in the description to Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And one half of me really would love to be proven right that it's not gonna make that big a difference to the numbers, but the other half of me is kind of gasping for air. So do check it out and share with your people. On that, to my patrons, Gary Milner, Ray Batanera, and Darko Rosinski, gents, really great to have you on board. Excited to have you here, and I'll see you on the funny pages of Patreon. To existing patrons, John Rimmer, Josh Walsh, and Berlin Heck, who up their pledges, I am very, very grateful for it, and thank you so much. Now, that's the end of episode 27. If you are in a slump, if you feel that you can't just get back out under your car for whatever reason, just remember, it's like writer's block. You have to just start. Pick a job, however big or small, it doesn't matter. Start into it, and it will snowball, guaranteed. So until I see you next time, Get stuck in and good luck. Adjust the seat forward, seat goes forward. Adjust the seat back, seat goes back. Adjust the seat forward, seat goes forward. Adjust the seat back, seat goes back.